It's an honor to be part of the closing session of the EFC's annual General Assembly. It's an honor, it's not a particular pleasure. It's not pleasant to talk about the um, crisis, and it's not pleasant to look at the picture, not a very pretty picture, of what's going on in the cities of our continent in these difficult days. Uh, my message today is very simple. We've been talking about innovation, we've been talking about uh, looking to the future, uh, and uh, let's keep doing this, by all means. But the danger of Europe, the danger uh, in the next year, things that are unfolding is real in our cities and neighborhoods and across the continent. So I think w as foundations, we, might, we must make sure that we're not only looking to the rosy picture of what the future could be, but also to the dark picture of what the future could have in store for us. Um, we must learn to, to also to fight defensive battles, to be on the rear guard, to ensure the things that took so long to build. Um, we are in the midst of this uh, economic crisis of unprecedented scope, and you know what it feels like. It's about unemployment. Um, we are at 12% across the EU, but some countries like Spain and Greece are uh, as, as far up as 27% unemployment. Uh, youth unemployment is at catastrophic levels. But it's also a crisis of poverty. And if you just consider that of the, uh, there's 20 member states of the European Union where the Red Cross is now distributing food aid. The Red Cross is now distributing more food aid than it has ever since the aftermath of World War II. Only in Spain, in my country, three million people depend on help to get by. Um, it's also a crisis of welfare, as you know, because of the cuts, because of the austerity. Um, and if you consider the fact that 40% of the Greek population cannot afford proper access to health, to health services, which is such a basic thing as health. You, you, can, you can see the scope of the welfare crisis. It's also an issue of migration, and, and of course there's lots of people coming to our cities and we have to manage that. But for many countries in Europe now, migration is emigration, it's leaving the country. Um, last year, there were more Portuguese living in Angola as economic migrants than there had been ever in colonial times. There was more people leaving every month Ireland last year, or at a faster, faster speed, than it had been the case since the Great Famine in the 19th century. In Hungary, you had not had the current levels of emigration ever since the Soviet, uh, Soviet invasion in 1956. Uh, and 60% of those who leave are in a very, very small age span, between 25 and 35. Latvia has lost 10% of its population to emigration. So the, history, uh, the story sorry, of migration is not just a story of people coming from Africa and Asia and elsewhere. It's also of millions of people who have to leave their own cities. And this also creates devastation, by the way, in the places that, that see the people, especially the young people, leave. Um, you know where the crisis has hit, has hit hardest, in the Baltics, in Ireland, in Southern Europe, in the Balkans. But what has happened in terms of cities? Well, the story is unfolding, but we already know some things about it. We know that some, some of the cities were the first places the wars hit at the very first moment, um, either because they were big exporters or very dependent on industry, or because they had a big construction bubble. Um, cities which were being rapidly suburbanized, like Riga or Dublin or Madrid, uh, suffered a lot from the crisis. Um, and also other cities which recovered very, very quickly but suffered very much at the beginning, such as Stuttgart, for example, because of being so dependent on one industry. Um, but they also were, in many places, island of resilience. They were, for example, the Eastern European capitals have fared better than most of the country. This is because they, were, they had the administration, they had services, they had a more diversified economy than most other cities. Um, but being a capital is not always a blessing. You could become the magnet of problems like Athens has become. And nowhere is the crisis more apparent in Greece than it is in Athens, where many of the problems concentrate. Um, and, and cities have a particularly difficult threat during the crisis, because national crises can last for five, ten years. City crises last much, much longer. We've learned this from Flint and Detroit in Michigan. We've learned this, this from the East German cities in Sachsen-Anhalt and other lenders, which still now are losing people more than 20 years uh, after the changing system. Um, and we, we know of other cities which have gone through really long crises. Some of them are basically out, like Marseille. Others are still in the crisis, like Charleroi in Belgium, which is a city where the crisis is much more acute than, it, than anything else going on in the country. Um, 
But this is not a socioeconomic crisis only. Um, we have fundamental values like uh, human rights, like civil liberties being um, questioned. We have a breakup of solidarity. And um, we see this in elections where extremists are rising in many corners of Europe, but also in the streets of the cities, um, where extremist action, unfortunately, is, is more and more common. Um, and it's not only the fringe. In the mainstream, nationalism, lack of solidarity, discrimination is taking a bigger and bigger role. Not just, the, not, not just these extremists, but serious politicians, even sometimes mayors, are part of this problem. Um, and there's flashpoints across Europe. And I would, for example, mention here the situation of the Roma. And the, the, the fact that anti-Roma sentiment and anti-Roman speech has become almost banal, it has become so general in places like the United Kingdom, Italy, France, let alone some places in Central Europe, then it's almost like if it's not racism, like it's acceptable to say some, some things about the Roma, that if we heard them about black people, about Jews, for example, they would bring horrible memories. And we don't realize the extent to which this is happening now. In politics, there's also a crisis of trust. Um, consider this, 64% of EU citizens do not trust their national, their national governments, 68% don't trust their parliaments. 80% don't trust the political parties that supposedly represent them. Right? The trust in the local government, in the national government, sorry, is below 15% in eight EU countries. Some of them as large as Italy or Romania. Um, regional and local authorities are faring a little, be a little better. So it's almost balanced. You have 50% of population who doesn't trust them, 43% who trust them. Why is trust so important? Well, we've been um, funding some research about who votes for the populist, national populist parties, for the Trufins in Finland, or for Golden Dawn, or for Jobbik, or for Front National. And what they have in common is not age, is not socioeconomic status, is not uh, the level of studies, is not even gender. What they, all the voters of these parties have in common is that they are at least 20% less likely to be trusting institutions. Their trust in institutions such as the judiciary is 20% lower than that of the general population. And that's why a crisis in trust is a real danger to the, to the whole of democracy. Um, I also want to make it clear that the economic crisis and the political crisis don't always come very, very uh, strongly correlated. You have big successes of xenophobic populist parties in places where economic crisis is not that strongly felt. We've, we've seen Norway, Switzerland, or Finland elect in large amounts xenophobic populists. We've also seen some of the hardest hit countries, and some which have high rates of immigration, like Portugal, Spain, and Ireland, not going for these kind of options. But where the two crises coincide, where the economic crisis is very strong and the values crisis is very strong, then the picture that emerges is really ugly. And it's not only Greece, it's also Hungary, for example. And also other places in southeastern Europe have the same situation. So what can foundations do in this, in this uh, uh, difficult context? Um, in the economic crisis, we have several roles to play. One is not very sexy, it's not very fancy, but it's really important. I would call it to be, as it were, the, plung, the, the plug in the sink or the stitch in the wound. It's kind of building resistance in these very small points where things can go really, really wrong. Or, for example, coming where the cuts have created a situation which in the long run can be disastrous. Let me give you two quick examples. In Catalonia, where I come from, the funds to help these people who are promoting schooling for Roma kids are being cut. In Thessaloniki, the same funds that are being used to, to take Roma kids out of the streets are being cut. Are we going to fail yet another generation of Roma and all have them go through education, not succeed in education, and then for the, for the rest of their life be in a disadvantaged position? Let me give you another example. Distribution, free distribution of needles for intravenous drug users has been, has been discontinued in Romania, in Greece, in Hungary. There's an epidemic raising of HIV AIDS. How much will this cost over time in terms of suffering, but also in terms of money? So th those are points where we can make a difference very quickly. We, 
as foundations are also as what I would call the innovators of last resort, where everyone else is too busy, too burdened with debt, too embattled to look ahead, we have to be able to look ahead. Look ahead, as I said before, to see the rosy picture of what could be, but also the dark picture of what could be and we don't want to happen. And then use our ability to innovate, to avert the worst case scenarios. Yesterday, a lot was said about the, another thing that we could do, which is being catalysts, which is being the ones that make the different opportunities, the needs, uh, come together. We know that our structural funds, for example, the, the EU structural funds, are not very flexible. They are not reaching the most marginalized communities. They are creating terrible gaps in funding that are killing NGOs. And we can go there. And we don't even, even, even need to go there with grants. We can go there with loans. We can bridge these periods. We can help them build good proposals. There's a lot we can do to mobilize this money. In these moments of terrible crisis, the European Social Fund and the European Refugee Fund are not spending nearly as much as they could. And this is paradoxical, but that's what's happening. Um, what can we do in the political crisis? Well, in the political crisis, we can act a little bit as wild, wildfire rangers, removing flammable elements, uh, in particular those of us which are very well rooted in their communities. Uh, and this means working on education, this means working on local anti-rumor strategies, working on rebuilding local solidarity between the communities. But we can also act as, in a way, minesweepers, detect these explosive situations at the local areas, which if they do turn wrong, they can completely poison the whole national debate. Um, there's, you know of examples in, in, in your own countries, places where now investment is, investment is urgent before the situation becomes nationally untenable. Often, for example, the arrival of 5,000 Roma in a city is not a big, big thing, but it can completely change the debate in the city and in the whole country. One last thing about the political crisis. One thing we cannot be is impartial. We can be impartial about political parties. We cannot be impartial about discrimination. We cannot be impartial when the situation is becoming toxic in the areas we care about. Um, most of these works are inspired by our work in Greece. Um, we are having this initiative called uh, Solidarity Now. And I would like to finish uh, um, my, my presentation talking a little bit about, about Greece. Um, Greece is this terrible place where kids faint at school for inadequate nutrition, where medical centers cannot operate heating in, in the coldest part of winter, where teenagers inspired by Golden Dawn are going and throwing stones at Pakistani shops, where 14-year-old Afghan boys are selling their bodies in the, in the parks of Athens for as little as 3 euro, 10 euro for unprotected sex, where you have one racist attack in average every two days. But Greece is also the place where the civil society is coming back and is fighting this. And the Greek foundations have learned have understood that society, what society expects from them, and they are getting organized. And you would find the most inspiring people, and that's one of the pleasures I have in my job, going and meeting these people that are really understanding the situation in Greece and coming back. So I would say, this is not the, sto the, the, the story of Greece. It's about securing the future of Europe. Um, and what happens in Greece tells, and perhaps a magnified story of what's going on elsewhere. Um, so in my conclusion, I'd like to say that let's, by all means, be innovative, think about the future, include technologies uh, in, in, in our thinking. But let's also defend what we have. Let's defend Europe as a, as a common project. Let's defend uh, living together on, in our neighborhoods and cities. This, this crisis, as you've seen in the documentary before, is a real threat for the lives of people, for their everyday lives. Um, in crisis points like Hungary and Greece, and probably very, very close to wherever your foundation is. And if you think Scandinavia is free from this, think about what happened in Sweden three weeks ago. Finally, this crisis is also a real threat to Europe as a, as a united society based on values, based on human rights and civil liberties and solidarity. To a large extent, the battlefield of this crisis are neighborhoods and cities. And here is my last word. In my experience, and I've been going a lot to Greece, but as you know, the Open Society Foundations are very active in Central and Eastern Europe. I live in Spain, but I happen to be in contact, for example, in very close contact with migrant communities in Northwestern Europe. In these battles, open society, the values many of us stand for, the human rights, the liberties, dignity, are losing the battle. 
And I think that would be my strongest message. There's, there's a fantastic future ahead, a fantastic possible future ahead, but the battles to make this future possible have to be fought. We cannot just look at what we would like the future to be. And we also need to take into account that in some places we are on the losing side. Thank you. Thank you.